So we'll have to get him later. Mm, okay. Hello, welcome to the African Catalyst. Um, we thank you once again for being part of this live stream. Um, this is from Lagos, Nigeria, and we are talking about you know the Resilient Africa Week. So basically, the Resilient Africa Week is a virtual conference that brings together a number of key stakeholders within African industries to drive the growth and the issues that are inhibiting growth in Africa. And this is our inaugural session, and we've been able to assemble a number of panelists and speakers to discuss main issues related to opportunities you know, in the face of challenges in a post-COVID era. And we have um, our first inaugural panel session um, taking place here now. Um, we have a topic which relates to post-COVID Africa and how economics, um, how various economies in Africa can leverage on this crisis to spur a new growth strategy. We thank you once again for this, and please enjoy yourselves. Um, I, will, I will now hand you over to my other co-panelists uh, to basically start the discussions. Over to you, Moshope. Thank you very much, um, Femi. I'm Moshope Arubai, Chief Economist at Vetiva Capital Management Limited, and it's a delight for me to be moderating this session. With me in the session, I have an um, author from the OECD. Author, thank you for joining me. And I have a um, team as well from KFW Research. Thank you very much. And we're still holding up for Professor um, RMO. He's probably having some technical issues. He'll join us um, as, as soon as he can, hopefully. So um, the year 2020 has been quite an um, eventful one. Uh, I, I dare say we've, we've had better years. Um, a global pandemic is, is in full swing and is poised to up, upend um, lives and livelihoods dampening any previous optimism we had for for growth in the year. Since the um, onset of the outbreak, um, various economic units, individuals, businesses, and governments at different levels have been reeling under the impact of the um, pandemic. Uh, for Africa, the critical role that um, commodities and tourism have to play in our economic structure makes the region particularly vulnerable at this time not only to shocks to its um, public health system, but also to shocks to its external demand uh, for its um, resource and non-resource export. So myself and my co-discussants will be shedding more light on um, Africa's current economic reality and how the region can position itself for a sustainable growth post um, COVID. So team, I'll be um, starting with you. Um, looking at um, Q1 macro numbers that have been released um, so far from Africa, it appears that Africa, the impact of the um, pandemic in Africa has been less severe 
compared to um, what I've seen from um, um, developed economies. So the likes of Nigeria, Rwanda, Ghana, even though slow, uh, slower growth was recorded, but we've been spared the um, magnitude of contractions which we've seen in, in, in developed economies. What do you think are the reasons behind this um, disparity in impact? Yes, thank you. And also a pleasure to be here and speak about economic issues and the economic impact of the current crisis. Before I answer your question, I will sort of briefly introduce myself. As you said, I'm an economist at KFW Research. KFW is the German Development and Promotional Bank. We are active in various sectors, mainly focused on Germany, but we also handle the international development aid for Germany and also supporting uh, Africa and African economies. Um, answering your question, well, yes, um, so far we don't really see the impact. That's mainly because the Q2 numbers haven't really come out yet. Um, while we haven't really seen an impact yet, and uh, not even in the Q1 numbers, is I would say is that related to the time lag of the crisis as well as its geography. In Q1, it, the crisis mainly affected China. And at the end of Q1, we saw actually drop in tourism numbers coming to Africa. Um, but uh, we, given the nature of trade, Africa has with China, it's right at the beginning of value chains, it's mainly raw, unprocessed material. So our experience from the past crisis, the 2007 to 2010 global financial crisis, there was a time lag in terms of the export and import figures. Um, so we really have to wait. I will imagine that we will see some numbers or some figures actually coming down in Q2 because it also coincides with the crisis having an impact in Europe, the US, yeah. and then later in Latin America. And the last one in the chain is really Africa, where the crisis is now really taking a hold. Um, so even when we look at some soft figures, I mean, the Q1 data is really the hard economic data we usually rely on to to guess the impact of something. But when we look at the soft indicators, for example, PMI market, we already that they are seeing that they are pointing down that they have been dropping massively in March and May uh, when the lockdown effects and the social distancing measures were introduced across Africa, and particularly in the larger African economies such as South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt. So they are very much in contractive environment. They drop massively. They recover a bit at the end of with the beginning of May when the first measures were eased. Um, but they still point at a, that it will have we will have see a huge huge impact, uh, economic impact, uh, uh, related to the Corona crisis and and the and the and the containment measures. And also the Google Mobility indicator, so there's another sort of soft indicator. They're really showing that, for example, travel to work, travel to recreation sites really has dropped uh, with, with the corona taking a hold on the continent. So we really have to prepare for a huge, huge impact um, coming from various channels. Uh, domestic consumption, a drop probably in also that is related to the economic crisis in Europe and US. So as will be a drop in remittances, um, of course, we've mentioned the drop in oil prices or the drop in raw material prices and raw materials, etc. So, unfortunately, we will see the impact probably now when the Q2 figures will be coming out at the end of the month and later. Oh, okay, um, thank you very much, team. Um, Arthur, so team um, had already um, um, highlighted the fact that Commodity prices have softened. We've also seen a drop in, in, in tourism to the region. And these are like two main sources of um, um, revenue for the region. Um, so technically, we expect a sharp drop in, in revenue. The, and this is going to further like narrow the fiscal space that was already under pressure pre-corona. How do you think um, African countries can cope um, with still financing their development goals um, in view of the fact that there are other challenges that are also simultaneously putting pressure on their finances at the moment. Thank you, Mazope, and thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. Um, I think the main uh, issue here is that the current crisis, despite its magnitude, should not sweep the countries over the carpet, and, that, and uh, the key objective is to remain 
focused on the goals of the African Union and the Agenda 2063. It's a long-term strategy that is there to, to stay with, depending, whatever the storm, the, the strategy is there for countries to achieve the transformation. So now with regards to the fiscal space that you mentioned, uh, the first key area for intervention is happening today. It's about debt restructuring uh, or a canceling of the debt that is being negotiated with the G20, with the Paris Club, with the World Bank, with the IMF, with different packages that have been already being uh, set up. Let's rem uh, remind ourselves that debt is the, about 60% of Africa's GDP. And if, they were, if the, um, the African countries were to set the same type of stimulus package that the European countries would have, it would increase to about 80%. So there, is, there are big discussions there, but it's, it's the first tool for countries to have pro-cyclical uh, uh, policies. The second and very important one for the fiscal space, and that very much depend on the debt, is the taxes. Taxes are about 17.2% of tax to GDP ratio, uh, which has increased uh, in recent years, but very recently has stagnated. And there's also huge heterogeneity between the African countries. We are also expecting that with the crisis, the taxes will decrease. Uh, because of the reduced consumption, because of the reduced exports and the falling commodity prices. Uh, so there is further bracing is needed there. But to give you an insight into the heterogeneity, we look at countries like Nigeria, it's about 5.6% of tax to GDP ratio. So that's far too low. But if we compare with countries like Tunisia or the Seychelles, it's about 34% of tax to GDP ratio. So it's better than the OECD average. So some African countries have been doing very well here, and they scope to learn from the different African countries uh, uh, what type of tax measures uh, uh, can be implemented to, uh, to, 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 to improve the situation. The third area for the fiscal space is, as Tim mentioned, is with regards to external financial inflows. And here it's important that, like for the, exp the um, exports, Africa remains more dependent on other world regions on the external financial inflows taking together uh, remittances uh, that are expected to drop at, by about 22%, but also overseas development aid, foreign direct investment, or portfolio. So if we compare Africa with uh, other world regions, uh, the external financial flows are about 10% uh, of Africa's GDP, compared to 6.6% for other developing economies. So here again, we see the dependency uh, and the vulnerability of the African continent uh, to uh, shocks coming from outside. And therefore, the policy priority for the future lays in the Agenda 2063, which is about regional integration, uh, having more and better trade to create more and better jobs on the continent through uh, regional uh, value chains. Uh, and by, having, by linking the foreign direct investment that is very important through technology transfer, through linkages, through the ecosystems, to the, the local... Uh, in particular, the small and middle-sized enterprises that are key to create jobs. They create about 22% of the net job creation today comes from the SMEs. Uh, so it's really key, and they cannot survive. They don't have um, um, support today uh, to face the crisis. Uh, and as Tim mentioned, the macroeconomic forecast will also depend whether we see a second crisis. So for now, Africa has been able to... Uh, to, um, to, to there has been a very good policy response. Policymakers in Africa have reacted very quickly uh, compared to other parts of the world. So that's very positive and that's a very good sign coming from the continent. Um, but it does not only depend on policies, it also depends on the global context and whether the pandemic will, will have a second shock. Uh, so that remains to be seen and we know in the coming months and weeks as the, the, the trade and the global economic situation uh, unfolds and as we also get more up-to-date data that, uh, to monitor the situation. Okay, thank you very much, um, Arthur. I'm still with you. You work with the OECD, and um, OECD member countries are usually regarded as the big brothers to developing um, economies. Um, how much capacity do you think um, member countries of the OECD have at this time to provide aid to Africa, um, like you had mentioned, um, considering the fact that they've also been severely dealt with by the pandemic, and you have developing um, economies requesting for aid simultaneously. So how much capacity do they have at the moment to support Africa at this time? 
Thank you, Mr. Pace. We are, we are brothers and sisters, but we are not bigger than you. So I work here at the OECD Development Center. We have about 57 member states, and including 11 member states from Africa. So we speak on an equal to equal uh, partner basis and all the member states have uh, the equal stakes uh, and uh, equal uh, uh, voting rights at the OECD Development Center. And the idea for us is to have a platform for policy dialogue, to exchange on best practices with up-to-date data on how to shape better policies for better lives. So we are also, it's a mutual learning process uh, that we learn a lot from Africa and, uh, and we want to exchange uh, uh, how to answer to this crisis together. And this is why your, 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 your question is very pertinent because the crisis, the response to the crisis will depend on the ability of the, uh, of the African countries the, through the aegis of the African Union, but the whole international community to find a common answer through uh, uh, co development cooperation. And here, while ODA is of course very important, I think the onus is on the, obvious, is on the debt uh, um, the debt negotiations that are taking place right now. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's about 57.9% uh, of tax of, uh, of the, the GDP, um, of the debt to GDP ratio. And if you compare with overseas development aid, it's about 2.4% before the crisis. So you see the scale of magnitude of what we're comparing. But at the same time, there are also great discrepancies between the type of ODAs that goes to the different African countries. Some countries, uh, some African countries uh, are relying uh, on, uh, on overseas development aid in, um, um, uh, and it's the first type of financial flows uh, that they find in about 26 uh, countries. So it remains very important for some countries, in particular for the, for the least develop, uh, developing countries. Uh, and it is also important that the OECD economies, we have among the OECD economies, only five countries have met the, uh, the international commitment of meeting the 0.7% of, of having ODA uh, as a share of the, of the commitment to, to developing uh, countries. So it's important that the ODA can continue to step up. It's a, a reliable, it's an important uh, source of flows for many countries, but it can also better be uh, uh, used, uh, as mentioned, be related, linked to the, to the debt is very important. Uh, also finding synergies between the countries like Nigeria that are better able to find the debt uh, through euro bonds or through private uh, debt. Let's mention that the, the, while um, the share of the, the debt in many African countries has increased, it remains nonetheless sustainable in many countries, but the issue is the structure of the debt. What we see is that the foreign debt has increased from about 11% 10 years ago to 20% today and before the crisis hit. And this may have, and similarly for the debt issued in foreign currencies that is typically more volatile. Um, and so there are trade-offs here that need to be uh, agreed upon with the international community, the Paris Club, the G20, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, through uh, the, the OECD uh, and the development finance institutions that can act as a platform for the dialogue uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to answer to, to that issue. And finally, there's also an important player in African markets, uh, the South-South cooperation and China, of course, that has played a more important role in the last decades. Let's mention that the, the Belt and Road Initiative is about $5.4 billion in the, only in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2018. Of course, there are question marks with the crisis. Will it be able to continue? It's mainly investment in large infrastructure projects that are becoming a lot more difficult to implement with uh, confinement policies. But nonetheless, there are many players there, and this is why international cooperation is very important to ensure inclusiveness and transparency for the African countries and for the African people. Thank you very much, um, Otho. And I think uh, Professor Ramu has succeeded in, in connecting. Prof, welcome to the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Ramu is a consultant, uh, a trade and investment consultant with um, ECOWAS. So I think he'll, he'll be in a better position to introduce himself properly. But um, Prof, sorry that I have to do this, but I, I, I think I need to um, uh, 
hit you with a qu uh, my question right now because I actually need okay. your perspective on on trade. Um, team had already had met, had um, pointed to the fact that the region is commodity dependent and that forms um, a significant part of um, um our trade. So um with the with the um with the pandemic with the um, pandemic we've 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 seen that commodity prices have gone down it has adversely it's, it's like it's going to um adversely affect um our trade um flows uh pre pre covid we've already seen that um a number of countries globally were tending towards nationalist um, positions so everybody was trying to look inclusive everybody was bringing up policies to drive their own internal growth at the detriment of whoever whichever whichever other country and there's a likelihood that post covid this trend would continue and considering the fact that africa is like reliant on 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 trade flows how do you think this could impact africa post covid should we see um a, a an acceleration in a breakdown in multilateral um, relations um, after the COVID crisis. Thank you. I think I must first of all apologize for my coming late to the program. And uh, my name, just as uh, I've been introduced, is Jonathan Alemu. I'm a professor of international economic relations of Covenant University and a uh, consultant with the POAS Commission and an expert on African continent of free trade area on investment protocol with African Union. Uh, just back to your question, it's rather unfortunate that the entire global space is moving back to what we had in 16th to 18th century. And what is it? It's the mercantilist era. The era of mercantilism, the era in which people believe that if you export, you are better off. If you import, you are worse off. But the real question is that if everybody wants to export and nobody wants to import, then who will they sell to? So that's that actually what they say that, uh, I mean. Let us see the uselessness of uh, mercantilism, the uselessness of excessive protectionism. You see, our countries have a trade in blames. I mean, when you listen to the American and the Chinese promoter of trade, Mr. Wang uh, Jive, he recently said that uh, the rising protectionism, we have negative impact on the global space. And not only that, that uh, he described it as a short sighted, narrow minded, and the uh, behavior that we fundamentally watching the situation of the global space. But America replied that uh, Chinese is the major culprit of this, because Chinese embark on actually supporting exports on energy so that they can make the price of their export to be cheaper. You see, so people have been trading blames. I mean, I mean France, France as of now is, uh, uh, you know, 14 times better, in terms of uh, 14 times greater than uh, its own exposure to other countries. Uh, exporting to them. So you discover that nearly all countries are, you know, more or less participating in this era of uh, what you can call uh, progressive protectionism. Which to me, it is the era of where we left behind before free trade uh, uh, theory came up, even in Latin America. But unfortunately, we are having our own fear here, even in Africa. I mean, you recall that Nigeria closed its border to. Equus, despite the fact that is the big elephant in the Equus region uh, because of uh, the reason of the uh, issue of uh, dumping and all those kind of things. And then all of us were caught up. We were caught up in uh, the problem of, uh, we were caught up in the problem of the COVID and uh, with the issue of uh, this uh, uh, protectionism to which every country have been engaging upon. And unfortunately, we are not all caught up in uh, COVID. And COVID aggravated this by blocking uh, you know, borders of member of countries, even where we have economic integration. So the issue is that, just as you now ask, will this now be worse off after uh, COVID? Or even only without COVID being finished, will this continue and will it not actually affect multilateralism? But let me say this one. Within the global space, one country or the other have been engaging in free trade area with another. That's why the fact that we all belong to WTO. I was privileged to be in uh, the last ministerial course of WTO in uh, Argentina. And uh, what happened there is that each of the compartments within the uh, global space were actually talking of what to benefit them. And that is not in the spirit of multilateralism. 
to the extent by the time we finished that particular conference in December 2017, we could not actually get a concrete committee that we can see we can hold upon. Investment facilitation, which was taken here, no way. E commerce, no way. If another one that has been negotiated on pro basis, we couldn't conclude. So with equal when COVID-19, what will actually happen? To me, I think that um, multilateral regionalism, multilateral uh, communication, um, uh, what can I call it? I think uh, regionalism on multilateralism has provided under Article 24 of WTO will continue. Country will continue to engage in economic integration among themselves. It's provided by WTO. But it shouldn't be at the detriment of the global space. But the good thing about this is this. In Africa, we have really suffered in the past many years, initially under slavery, followed by colonization. I think this is the time Africa need to be able to actually put themselves together. Luckily enough, 1991, Africa emerged with African Economic Treaty that gave back to the current economic integration, which is in phases from free trade area to custom union, from custom union to common market, common market to economic union. I think um, Africa need to be able to face this one squarely. And that is exactly what happened when COVID came in. In fact, the African continental free area, which is the first phase of the economic integration, was just coming on board. And in March, um, the Secretary General just resumed and he resumed into the era of the COVID problem. So uh, Africa is prepared. And this is what I will say that despite the situation, Africa can use the issue of COVID to be able to look around at what they can do for themselves. Uh, I don't know whether I've been able to add it, but I'm going to actually talk more if you permit me, because I see I have quite a lot of things to say. I think it's sure, with COVID, Africa can use it as a leverage opportunity. Why? Before, transnational corporations that belong to developed countries are small, less dominated seeing. In fact, Okta reported that 75% of the global trade and investment have been carried out by transnational corporations, which, and these corporations belong to developed countries. And lo and behold, they buy raw material from Africa and then they have finished product. But why can Africa not use this COVID to be able to start having a whole continental uh, transnational corporation that we have affiliate in different countries and then they will use it to be able to go into uh, integration among themselves. Because right now the whole entire global space appears to be more or less on the same phase. So it's an opportunity for company within the African space using the investment protocol of African continent retail area using the provision between the trade in services, trade in uh, goods, and other purposes of African continent retail area to enhance selling among them, and therefore allow to the group quite a lot of bigger corporations that will be African focused so that this company can continue selling among themselves instead of relying on the transnational corporations that actually have been making the continent over the years. I think the coronavirus situation is an opportunity for Africans to look in what and then use continental economic integration to be able to enhance their own particular opportunity. I actually agree with you, Pro. I, I, I agree. Countries will still continue to trade with each other regardless of um, um, increasing protectionism. Um, however, countries that trade together are most likely to vote together. So in a situation where you're at the multilateral level and issues of Africa is being um, discussed, I feel country, if Africa countries trade more together and they, they're able to form that um, integration amongst themselves, there's a tendency they'll vote um, in, the, in, the, in the same direction when they're, when, when they're um, addressing um, African issues at the um, multilateral level. Um, but Prof, still with you, um, over, uh, over okay. the past, uh, since COVID came, um, there have been um, indications that um, going forward would be seen, um, uh, there will be like an increase in the frequency of pandemics um, and they could be more severe than, than um, COVID-19. From a trade and possibly investment perspective, how do you think African hmm. countries can um, protect, them, um, protect themselves from the adverse economic um, impacts of future um, pandemic shocks, because what we're what we're seeing now, as um, author had said, what the pandemic now has like 
brought out ex pre-existing vulnerabilities. And we won't want to find ourselves in this situation maybe five, 10 years down the line with the, um, in the event of another pandemic. So within, within, within the shortest possible time, how do you think African countries can um, mitigate, um, uh, protect themselves against um, such economic, um, adverse economic impact? Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, the entire global space, the entire globalization, and what is globalization, all of us we are open to the, the same world at the same time. So uh, to be able to say that uh, you won't allow something to affect you or come to your country now is going to be difficult. But you can still actually use your own national, regional, and continental policy to be able to make sure that you, you, you don't allow all this uh, pandemic to enter your country. I think that at African uh, uh, continental level, we have uh, a center for disease control for the entire continent. And then we have their counterparts at individual rex. So there must be a lot of collaboration to actually make sure that this kind of a thing, they have to find solutions to, so that economic situations, they will not be actually affected the way it is affecting everyone now. So I believe that as we are talking of economic integration, it's not going to be only on trade. It's not going to be only on investment, but it's going to equally invest in include such integration in terms of uh, medical field, production of pharmaceuticals. I mean, because you can all say that uh, you won't have anything to do with the word aim. Uh, somebody was telling me about it this ago. He said, Corona is falling to Africa. It doesn't originate here. So if we have been able to protect ourselves very well, it's not come. I said, but they're part of the world. They're part of the world. And there's nothing you can do about it. So what we and can we have do now... Yeah, yeah, you're part of the world. So what we can do about it is that we need to be more alive to our responsibility at national level, at regional level, that's an individual regional economic community. We have eight of them in the entire Africa. ECOWAS is one, SADEC is one, we have COMESA, we have uh, South African economic community. All of them each have their own center of uh, disease control. They must be able to have a sort of uh, uh, regional arrangement with respect to that. But more importantly, there must be that continental uh, opportunity also to be able to address it and block. But more importantly, is that while you are in addition to all these health issues, we shouldn't forget that paying attention to economic issues equally is very important. Why? Because if people are healthy but they are starting to eat, then, I mean, they say the two things we end up in, in, in debt. And that is why in many African countries you discover it's sit at home, sit at home. It can't last for too long. Because people need to go out, so people are daily paid. So what we need to do is why I'm trying to share them, this kind of part, them from entering our region, at the same time, the producing capacity must be actually be encouraged to be able to come. And more importantly, the free protocol that enhance our economic integration in terms of trading goods, trading services, greater volume of investment. Imagine with continental or international corporation that we actually invest in different countries and then you to them among themselves. When you look at our trade booths among ourselves in Africa, it's about 20%. But look at um, European Union, you know, 60 something percent. Why, why? And then when you look at um, East, you look at NAFTA. NAFTA is about 40%. We are not trading among us. That is why head of state, like that, um, the president of Kenya, Said that we cannot continue to trade with you, with America, with Asia, but not trading among ourselves. So this pandemic has created a situation where we must look for solutions to be able to trade among ourselves. So that global exposure to everything, including trade and pandemic, will actually be minimized to a certain extent. Okay, um, thank you, Prof. I'm building on what you said. Um, in in addition to um trading amongst ourselves, it's important. Trading amongst ourselves is important so as to discover new markets. Um the Europe yeah. and Asia like, constitute a significant portion of of our uh, of our market, and Africa is less than 15%. So the, the, the issue I think we, we have as a as a region is the fact that we're all commodity exporters like we're all we we don't we we don't have the um value chains in place to to produce we don't have the industry so it's important if if we're going to even have to trade amongst ourselves 
ourselves. We're going to have to um, invest in industry, make sure that at least we have like in, um, industrial um, powerhouses in, in the region that would be able to facilitate um, the production of finished goods and enable us trade amongst ourselves. However, a number of countries have um, uh, paid lip service to industrialization in, over over the years, and we're still we're still at at the same spot. Um, so, team, which countries on the re in, in the region do you think 10, 15 years down the line could be the um, industrial powerhouses of the region? Considering the people countries that you feel are putting in the work now quietly but they're still actively putting in the work to try and scale up the industries in their country. Which countries do you think um, have that um, potential? Yes, uh, of course, I have to get my glass bowl out now and, 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 and wrap it very thoroughly to, in order to see in, into the future of what will happening. I, I wouldn't be that pessimistic, actually. I think there are a couple of things that actually happened on the African continent, especially when in regards to fostering or developing a manufacturing base. And of course, looking into the future, I see these sort of early starters of industrialization, uh, certainly in North Africa, Egypt, Tunisia, and Morocco, they will still be there probably, um, exporting manufacturing goods uh, across continents. And certainly they wanna capture a market share of the growing African market. And of course it will be South Africa, it will be right there. Of course, um, that, also depends, certainly when we look at South Africa, a lot of preconditions that need to happen. They have various problems and issues that have to sort, they have to sort out. They, I think they're pretty aware of that and they are already starting, although it's a slow process. Um, it, it, reforming is slow, it can be slow. There are various sort of stakeholders that have to be convinced that actually reforms are good. I mean, speaking from a German experience, they're not having that easily here either. Of course, the, the centers of gravity are, can be very strong. And of course, there's sort of more recently emerged manufacturing hubs, uh, certainly in East Africa, when we think about Ethiopia and Kenya, and also uh, right at the West, West, in West Africa, there's Senegal. So are these sort of recently emerged nodes of manufacturing. And given they continue with that investment, and the priorities they were given to fostering a manufacturing base, I think there is a huge potential that they will be still there, um, slightly bigger uh, than maybe they are today, but certainly also transformed. I think the experience of, experience of becoming an industrial hub or fostering a manufacturing base will be very different, certainly from the Asian experience and the Chinese experience. And by Asian experience, I really mean the sort of Taiwan and um, and Singapore and Korea. Um, I mean, the world economy has changed and um, it has changed uh, in a direction where it becomes more digital, um, more just in time. And recently the Corona crisis has put a premium on to the stability of global value change. I mean, they all will certainly um, have an impact on the development of the manufacturing sector in Africa. Um, so, yes, they, they could still be there, but they have to certainly also continue their investment and they slightly have to change their investment priorities. Um, they have to continue to invest in the basic infrastructure like transport, energy, but I will also mention education. I mean, the industrial worker in 20, 30 years time will need to have very different skills. And they also shouldn't neglect the other sectors. Um, we saw this in Ethiopia. They opened up as a manufacturing hub, but that they didn't really open up in the service sector. So there were, for example, at the beginning, huge issues when it came to logistics and telecommunication. They're addressing that now. They're allowing foreign players in. They're also deregulating to some extent the market. Um, I don't mean that they all have to definitely de deregulate. I mean, they have to foster national champions and actually can provide the quality international exporters and importers need to have. So from that perspective, I see so about five or six African countries that actually will be there in 20 to 30 years time if they, of course, continue to invest and also change a bit of their focus of investment. And of course, the major prerequisite is that the recovery of global markets as well, um, with, without actually, um, without that and also without foreign money coming in, I think it would be very, very difficult 
to oh. engage the manufacturing space, uh, place, uh, space in Africa. I'll leave it to here now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, um, audience, very soon we'll be getting into the um, Q and A session. So, if you have any questions which you'd like the panelists to address, questions as we can within the um, allotted time. So, um, finally, uh, we've highlighted clearly that Africa has like a number of. Um, development issues, that development challenges which we need to address as quickly as possible to be able to put ourselves on uh, on the path of sustainable growth post-COVID. What are the key decisions that Africa leaders, policymakers in Africa, have to make at this time to ensure that we keep up um, we keep up the spirit of putting um, Africa on the growth map post-COVID? Arthur, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. I uh, thank you, Mr. decisions do you think? Yeah. Uh, I'll answer your question, but I would also like to come back to a few points raised by Tim and, uh, and Jonathan, if you don't mind. So, uh, first on your question, uh, so the, the priorities. So, uh, yes, uh, on, on the COVID. So, we published a brief that you can find on the, our, uh, the OECD website, uh, also using a policy tracker that we used uh, looking okay. at um, many African countries' policies and what are the policies they have implemented as the, the COVID crisis. Uh, the recession has been hitting uh, the world economy and how African countries have reacted. Uh, as mentioned, the reaction was prompt uh, and, um, uh, and, and that was very good. Uh, and we focus into three different sequences, three different steps. The first one is um, at, at immediately, um, in the immediately uh, short and midterm uh, policies. So the first one is to look at the humanitarian aspects and to uh, make sure that the pandemic will not be uh, further widespread. Uh, of course, uh, the question is not whether to mimic or not uh, uh, the other uh, countries in Europe and, and elsewhere. The question is really to make sure that the pandemic uh, spurs out of control, especially given the vulnerabilities of the continent uh, with regards to the healthcare systems, uh, where we have you know, three times less uh, hospital beds than in countries like the, the, the UK or the US or Spain, and six times less than in France. So we need to look at that and make sure that in the short term, uh, we can have masks are being provided by having actions, for example, through trade policies, uh, the about 90% of the pharmaceutical products are being imported from outside. So we need some of the trade distortions need to be eased there to make sure that uh, the, the answers can be, can be, the policies can help uh, private and public sectors answer promptly, immediately as part of the relief um, for, the, for the crisis. Of course, it also needs to take attention to the informal sector, huge. We have about 86% of the labor force in uh, most African countries in the informal sector, with 10% uh, having access to social protection mechanisms. So making sure that the people who are not registered who uh, cannot, who don't have bank accounts, uh, can also uh, are not forgotten and can can be uh, benef benefiting from um, you know cash transfers through the digital uh, mobile money services. Here we have new opportunities with digitalization, also for the companies, the small middle sized enterprises, including in the informal sector, that can benefit from um, uh, guarantees uh, to guarantee the debt there to make sure. Uh, that the countries and the, 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 you know, the economic forces of the countries, the mainstay of the economy, can survive throughout the economy and through the first, uh, the first shock and also be prepared in case a second shock happens after the summer because it could happen in Africa, but it could also, as we have seen, be exported from outside. And even if the African economies and African people are less hit than the others, on the economic front, they are, the, the, the shock is terrible. Uh, so, so that's the first step, it's in the short term. The second one is also, um, uh, I mean, now and in the coming months, is to have the, um, the macroeconomic uh, leeway uh, through, through policies that can improve, uh, uh, help the spending of countries. If we take the, the, the situation of Nigeria, Nigeria used for, its for, for, for forecasting its spending the oil prices at about $60 the barrel. Now it hit $20 the barrel. 
and uh, most 90% of the government revenues come from the export of oil. So the situation is very different today than it was in January. And this needs to be taken into account and the, the monetary policies need to be adjusted. The inflation targets may have to be adjusted in some countries. As Jonathan highlighted, this needs to be done uh, together with um, the regional economic communities, uh, with the ECOWAS or with the, um, um, you know, the UMOA in the, in, the, in the Francophone countries of West Africa, for instance, where we have um, a monetary zone. And this has strong uh, implications for the future because we have strong discussions about the eco as a, as a common currency for West Africa, for instance. So there are wide ranging implications there. Um, uh, so, so that's the second step. And the third step is about the broad range objectives that I mentioned at the beginning with regards to productive transformation, with regards to industrialization, with regards to creating jobs, better jobs, and that goes in the manufacturing sector, but also in services. And in services through digitalization, through uh, increasing also, we have new activities like tourism that can help uh, create better jobs that are also very vulnerable to, 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 to shocks. Um, so here, um, working with international partners, through foreign direct investment, uh, with, uh, with the different tools that we have to, to finance development is key. Uh, and as Tim mentioned, uh, uh, foreign direct investment is very important here. And what we saw is that we saw um, a change in the way that foreign direct investment has been allocated in the continent. In the past, we've seen more foreign direct investment into the extractive industry. So just looking to swallow resources away from the continent and then export them outside completely untransformed. So in a way that, as Jonathan was highlighting, the African uh, countries, uh, particularly the resource commodity countries, uh, produce what they don't consume and they consume what they cannot produce, resulting in this balance between the exports and the imports. But now today we see a shift with the demographic trends, with the rising, the urban middle class uh, towards investment FDI going into market seeking, strategic investment, but also um, uh, investment seeking more efficiency, uh, particularly in services. So the investment has shifted from um, more than half in the extractive to more than half, more than 50% of the investment going into services. The, 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 the sad story here is that investment in manufacturing has stagnated. So we see the same share. So, um, and this is where the African countries need to get the act together uh, to be more competitive on international markets, uh, to, to be able to, uh, to attract more investment into manufacturing and to have this efficiency-seeking investment. And can we have success stories like Ethiopia, for instance, are uh, looking like to create about 8.5 million jobs through investment in manufacturing. But this is posed into question with the crisis. And the crisis could be an opportunity as we see that there are big debates in OECD economies about reshoring investment from Asian uh, to other countries because Africa has a, um, a geographic proximity, linguistic proximity, cultural heritage that can really help it make it more, um, more competitive. But the competitiveness is, um, is, um, is um, a cause for, it's not about bigger than neighbor policies. It's about competitiveness for, country, for African countries uh, to work together and to, uh, to, to be more attractive uh, through the regional economy communities uh, uh, as, um, as, as a union. And this is why the, the African Union is, is very, very important. And here there's a lot of work that needs to be done between the African countries, including with Nigeria, where we saw that there are lots of trade distortions and also where the trade with the neighboring countries uh, can be halted. We know uh, the reasons, but these are very clear issues for African countries to work on. And now let me um, refer to some of the elements that uh, uh, Professor Arimu was mentioning with regards to infra-Africa trade. Infra-Africa trade is about 17% of the total, uh, and which, is, uh, which is, holds a lot of promises because it, this is in trade mainly in semi-transformed uh, uh, goods uh, or transformed goods, and this is where we can have most jobs created by boosting the manufacturing sector. So intra-Africa trade is very important, and we also see a lot of investors, as Tim mentioned, from uh, African investors from South, South Africa, but also Morocco. Morocco has now 
overtaken South Africa as the main African investor in the continent. So there's a lot of synergies and a lot of things happening on the continent, very dynamic. However, um, with regards to the intra-Africa trade, um, the, the, the local value chains uh, are really insufficient. Uh, if, if we compare with, um, with um, uh, you know, developing countries in South Asia where the regional value chains are not so uh, well uh, developed, for instance, we have 85%. On the African continent, it may be 15%. So there is really scope to do a lot more to produce locally uh, through spatial economic zones. We could have big, large spatial economic zones uh, between countries by uh, tapping the, the comparative advantages of the countries. If we export cocoa, let's do like Ghana, that we can transform the cocoa, uh, work together with Ivory Coast. Uh, there is you know, 60% of the world production comes only from two countries, three countries if we add Cameroon. So there's big scope here for the private sector to invest. And this is why, why the investment in infrastructure power, of course, while it is crucial, uh, it needs to be done in key sectors where there's this transformative potential. So, uh, you know, the African Finance Corporation, for instance, would invest in Gabon to transform the wood and having the value of the export wood uh, being multiplied sevenfold after the investment infrastructure has happened because then the ecosystem is in place for the transformation to happen and to trade with the neighboring countries and then finally export uh, outside of the continent. But of course, investment in infrastructure is, is crucial and it's, it's, uh, it's one of the main uh, impediments to the productive transformation of the continent. But it that cannot happen without people. So this is why TVET, more investment into technical vocational training is needed, into skills. Great, pro um, great progress has been made with regards to education, for instance, um, but more needs to be done, uh, uh, particularly on the technical side. Uh, and this is technical is very important for the small and middle sized enterprises, but also to be more attractive for the FDI I was referring to earlier on. In addition to that, this calls for policies on the business environment, fiscal policies, and also look, uh, unlock new potential, new opportunities that are happening today, like digitalization. And this is why the COVID is bringing some uh, opportunities. We said that with the COVID, uh, about 34 countries have uh, adopted policies to enhance e-education through digital means. Of course, there are many issues everywhere around the world with that, but this is the first step. And we identified about 10 countries that went really a step further through digitalization policies by making transfers to companies, uh, cash transfers to vulnerable people, and so forth and so on. Uh, and so it's, there's great scope for, 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 for transformation here. And uh, a final note on what Tim was mentioning with regards to uh, the national champions and the transformation. So we worked a lot on that theme last year in our flagship with the African Union, the Africa's Development Dynamics Report on Productive Transformation. And we have big champions in Africa. We have the Dangote, we have many big, large companies that have gone into conglomerates and that have diversified because they need to diversify their business to become more resilient and less vulnerable to shocks. And that's the same for the African economies, need to become more diversified to be less uh, uh, vulnerable to external shocks. But the key issue that we have seen is that while we have these islands of excellence, the, um, the productivity growth and the gains from productivity have been stagnant in the overall economy. And uh, so uh, the key issue is how to diffuse the knowledge uh, that has been acquired in the African champions. There is knowledge that other companies, foreign companies, non-African companies would not be able to gain because they don't necessarily have the experience working on the continent. They don't know the markets. So this has to come from the African companies uh, and to grow. But the issue is that uh, the diffusion, uh, and therefore we have seen stagnant productivity growth in, uh, in, the, um, in the past. Uh, and, and to remedy that, uh, as I mentioned, it's very important to work on trade, to work on local transformation, infrastructures, skills, and business environment. Thank you. I spoke a lot, but uh, I thought it was important to mention. Thank you very much. Um, at the, this time, I think we can excuse you now so you can attend your um, next meeting. Um, I think Tom will be filling in for you, right? 
Uh, yes, I am very sorry. I have to leave in about six minutes. Um, I, uh, I hope my colleague will be able to join. I don't see him in the show, okay. though. Okay, it's, it's fine. Thank you very much. Your okay. contributions have been quite um, insightful. Prof, um, I see you have like additions to what um, Arthur has, has said. So I, th I think you can um, go now. Yeah, thank you, um, Manoto, for that wonderful contributions. And um, in Africa, maybe I need to mention some of the things that we are already doing in the area we have to have mentioned. You know, let me start with the ECOWAS Commission. We have actually been working for quite some time. Um, ECOWAS discovered that there is need to follow our economic integration in line with what the fund fathers put in place. And therefore, apart from the free trade area, which was in form of um, on the free trade area, which we call Equa Trade Realization Scheme, Equa of scale to the level of uh, the common external and other economic union. But more importantly, Equa is moving ahead to a common investment market on that common market. And then on the 22nd December 2018, Equa has its own investment code signed by all member states. That is to say, investment can move across borders to be able to enhance opportunities of collaborations among production, manufacturing, um, service, businesses, and everything. I was privileged to be the consultant of that project until it was signed by all the head of state. But we upscale this one. When the African Union discovered that this is the beautiful thing the is doing, then we, it was upscaled, and then the African Union equally uh, assemble some of us to put it together what we have an African investment code that one was finalized in uh, 2016 and we now have a code uh, for the entire Africa upon which the investment protocol in the next negotiation of African continent free trade area we are trying to be, be used so we are saying that again in Ecowas we have capital market integration the stock exchanges they are talking to themselves the, the, the security and the commissions have talked to themselves just to be able to make sure that capital can move across borders. Where there are shortages, then where there are soft surpluses that in other countries can move there so that one economic space can actually exist. Also, see, our trading in Africa, not only in the course, we use international currencies. And these international currencies deplete our foreign exchange. So we came up and said, why can we not have a payment system? And uh, right in Africa, uh, ECOWAS just finalized uh, last week, we just finalized last week, the completion of a uh, validation of uh, ECOWAS payment and settlement system. That is to say, that instead of using euro, dollar, to be able to trade among ourselves, why can we not have to use our domestic currency? I want to buy something in Ghana. And the Ghana man received the CD, which is the domestic currency, and once I can pay in my Nara in Nigeria, then we are saying, why should we actually use dollar? And then we say, Africa, Africa copy this, and this is what Africa is equally using in the implementation of uh, uh, African continent of free trade area. But more importantly, is that this is a serious wake up call at COVID 19. It's a wake up call that we can do quite a lot, and we have provided a lot of policy environment upon which member states. The course, member states in the course can actually continue to actually work upon. We have promotional base. Then, let me say this again. Most of the countries in the world that are called developed, they are developed because they manufacture, not that they produce primary products. Primary products are being put there by God. And therefore, if you cannot add anything to it, you cannot say you have developed. Therefore, we have abundance of the resources in terms of raw material, but we are moving ahead. And let me say this again, that we are saying one greater trade, one greater trade, but before you can trade, you have to invest. And that's why we put up a lot of uh, uh, environment that we enhance uh, trade. Another thing which I want to mention is this. For existing foreign investment in foreign rights investment and look at our portfolio investment in Africa, they are, they are corporate citizens of Africa. They will enjoy the same opportunity that's available. On the Pan-African government code, which I was part and part of those who are developing, as well as our common investment market code, they will enjoy it. But they will qualify it easier to be able to integrate on themselves better because they are African corporate citizens. Then 
the domestic entrepreneur also will be able to do a lot of vertical integration to this transnational cooperation existing in the region, and then the entire region will be off. What we need to do as a result of this pandemic is to make sure how we can better integrate among us in terms of investment, in terms of trading, in terms of services crossing border, in terms of movement of the people, in terms of technical skill, so, so that we can actually enjoy the cooperative ad advantage that has been given. And then rely solely on the developed country. And then right now, COVID-19 is not really allowing all those developed countries to be able to give up what they were giving up before. In, in terms of uh, things like development effort, in terms of money, uh, the money, the, uh, the big development partner, and then they were giving up, they themselves were having problems. So that's looking in what is far better now. And we see the opportunity to be able to ensure that a lot of activities among ourselves are enhanced. And so many meetings have been taking place. After this meeting, I'm going for another many, many meetings to be able to make sure that put Equus Africa, they actually see what they need to do and do them well. Let me stop in that place for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Super. I'm not hearing you. Uh, you need to unmute. You need to unmute. Okay. Um, Prof, thank you very much. I'll be taking uh, questions from the audience at this time. I see um, Tom is here to fill in for Arthur. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's really great to have you. Um, so we have this, this question from Botidem Jackson. Do you think the private sector in West Africa has the grit to drive growth? Um, I think um, I'll leave Tim to shed some light on that. <laughs> Do you think Afri uh, West Africa's or private sector has the grit to drive growth? I think it depends a bit. I mean, economists always say it depends on something. Uh, it depends on what you <laughs> The private sector, uh, of course, when you sort of the, the formal, the private formal sector is is very small in West Africa. Although uh, we see the thriving scene of startups and SMEs, and I think they will certainly will play a big, big role in the transformation of African economies. The question I have is the scale of the transformation. I mean, these still very, very small companies. So we really need to get a policy in place where we can actually grow them and also grow them in a way that they actually create jobs. And the, the other thing is probably the private sector that is actually looking at export markets, for example, the, the agricultural industries and agro-processing. But as Arthur said, as there is a growing middle class and upper class in West Africa, they also that their consumption patterns are changing and also their demands for the local food stuff is changing. Whether they actually can be able to meet that demand, that change demand, I think when they can do that, there's an opportunity to grow, of course. Although the, the Western African private sector is probably the most uh, dependent on raw materials and commodities. Um, so this will be a challenge when we think about the global environment. Oh, okay, thank you very much, um, team. Um, we have another question from Olua Fumilola Babalola. Do you think we should delay the economic integration plan like the AFTA? till each African country is able to at least jumpstart the economy to a reasonable level. I think I'll let Prof handle that. Prof. Thank you. Okay. Thank you uh, for me to for that question that do we have to delay after I think the answer is yes, it's, uh, and uh, that has been done at the initial time after operational uh, activity was to start this month. But we cannot now because quite a lot of countries are still battling with the coronavirus issue. Therefore, we are looking at uh, January 2021. So it has been delayed. The head of state of African Union has agreed about that. Um, that one is settled. But let me just contribute a little bit to what uh, Tim said, which is, I mean, Tim has tried to, can Equal's private sector actually drive growth? I think the answer is yes. 
We have Federation of West African Chamber of Commerce comprising the Chamber of Commerce of the 15 member states and the headquarters, the, the, sec the uh, secretary is in ECOWAS Commission. And a lot is done over there. Coincidentally, I'm the consultant. And a lot is being done to be able to make sure that the private sector are being integrated into the activities of ECOWAS Commission and they are joining together. They have different associations and then they know what to be do more, what to do more now than before. So I think very soon we shall actually see the West African of our choice and then later on the African of our choice as well. Because private sector are doing excellently well. Then at continental level, uh, we have an African Chamber of Commerce of which have attended their meetings well. So at a global level in, in, the, in the entire continent, we have the Chambers of Commerce equally looking at what they can do to the entire continent. So we are fully prepared. I think what uh, we, the problem we are having before is that we, we are too relaxed, but the COVID is waking us up that we need to be able to jack up if we want to actually participate in this uh, global space. Thank you. Um, okay, um, team, do you have any takes on the um, after question about yes, delaying um, the implementation? Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I must say, from sort of very distant perspective, I think that the process of, of, of economic integration is already slowing, uh, and it was slowing even before uh, COVID-19 hit the continent and prevented from the negotiations to going on. We saw this momentum really driven by sort of two key actors of the process, the Rwandan president, uh, and then it really slowed down with the takeover of the Egyptian president, the negotiations. And actually, when we look at the ratification of, of, the, of the treaty, that process has slowed down. I mean, we haven't really seen much ratification since last October. Um, so actually, countries becoming a bit more cautious or losing momentum of implementing it. Although at the technical level, I think the, con the negotiations continue to go on. They have to, of course, these sort of technical agreements have then, of course, have to be approved by the head of states. Um, but yes, I think also with the with the with the process or of implementing the continental free trade area is actually that it's also allowing for a lot of space for especially economic weaker countries to to negotiate and to be part of it. Um, and then yes. That's probably my answer to the question. We're already seeing a slowing of the process, uh, not only corona-related. Um, what's the reason for that? I really don't know. It's probably the lack of momentum and the the, lo lo the loss of a key key figure in driving that process, or that might be sort of people are countries are getting more cautious in terms of the economic impact. Although I don't think they will be very very big, uh, positive or neither negative. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, Tom has uh, uh, a take on the um, after question. Yes, thank you, Mo Sophie. And I just want to follow up to what Tim was just saying. I think I, I see this slowdown as an opportunity rather than a challenge. Because before we were moving very, very fast as well. And one of the fundamental thing, as Tim was pointing out, is very top-down driven and we haven't really had the time to bring on the private sector together in the discussion uh, to flesh out what do we want exactly and to build the consensus in in terms of the CFTA that we would like to build on so we so during this time I see this process negotiation can have the time to continue on and clearly that we have finalize the first round with the trade and goods agreement, but there's still many other uh, sessions that still need to be discussed, as Jonathan discussed, mentioned earlier, rules of origins, trading services. There's lots of them that now is the time and is the moment to, to really discuss, build the consensus and flesh out the details. So that is easier for us rather than five years down the road when we try to review something. It's become very complicated. So yeah, I think it's not necessarily this. 
Okay, I'm um, still with you. Um, we'll take this um, final question. In the short term, what should individual states across West Africa do to formalize the large informal sector? That's a question from Botinem Jackson. So any takes on, on this? What do you think African um, countries can do to formalize the informal sector? In Nigeria, for instance, the informal sector is quite is, um, constitutes a significant portion of, of the GDP. So how do you think we can bring them um, into the informal um, space? Can I? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. okay. yeah. So I think I think like in the short term, that the key thing is it still account for the majority of employment. So it is very key that we have to protect them actually. It is very key that we can allow that informal workers can still have access to their livelihood during the COVID time, but even in before COVID time. When, when we see urbanization is a strong drivers across Africa and the need for reorganization of informal sectors when sometimes with local government especially, there is a very strong hostility against the informal actors. So how can we embrace the informal actors like providing services for them, the marketplace and so that, that they can thrive on? I think that should be the immediate first thing to do. Now, there's along the way we would like to formulate and I see there there's probably two things that we need to do. First is this carrot and stick approach, right? So we need to provide the, the real incentives for firm to formalize by, provide, by providing what the services that justify why we are taxing them, placing additional burden on them. And the second one is more on the enforcement. And here I see the digitalization as a key component. So now that, especially in East Africa, where, where you see the volume of uh, uh, more payment being increased several fold with the COVID crisis, it is a great opportunity to first bringing all these actors to use digital platform. And once you are able to, uh, to have these things re registered into digital format, like then what is the central bank of Rwanda do is they have a digitalized uh, reporting system where every 15 minutes they would pull the data from all the mobile money transaction. As well as every day they would pull all the reporting data from the different banks so that they can solely control what is going on on the flow of money in, in, in the process. Then that then there you can improve on your enforcement. So that is the first carrot and stick. As, and the third dimension is, we also have to think about creating jobs in the formal sector as well. And if you were to look at all the self-employed workers, which is the large part of, this, of the informal sector, then a third of them do so because they cannot have access to any other jobs is still so livelihood. So there it comes back to our discussion earlier about creating jobs in, in the formal sector by using industrialization to our advantage and also developing the digital economy. So I think those are in the short term, protect them in the long term, uh, carrot and stick, and build jobs in the formal sector. Those I will see are really a three thinking about the problem yeah thank you very much team would you have a few um um follow-up um, ad additions to what he said nope no actually i think the the ocd is more qualified to comment on that question than i am so i would <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we might not be able to won't be able to attend to um, any further questions. However, we implore you to um, participate actively in the um, Resi um, Resilient Africa Week LinkedIn discussion forum, where we'll be able to discuss the way forward for Africa and also um, take as many questions as as you may as you may have you can refer to the confirmation email that came with um, your registration for a link to um, join the discussion forum that said 
Uh, on behalf of the organizers and my fellow panelists, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining in our conversation today, and we hope you'll join subsequent sessions. Cheers. Thank you, Raj. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Okay.